And we will begin with some closing remarks by Dr. Machidiso Muete, who is the WHO Regional Director for Africa. So please welcome Dr. Muete. Good afternoon to everyone. I just want to check that I'm actually audible. Yes, I am. So a very good afternoon to you all. And uh, to the organizers, a big thanks for the opportunity to deliver the closing remarks on how to advance the world towards food systems that enhance health. I've just caught the summaries that were being presented from the different groups and feel indeed very encouraged and very inspired by the discussions that you held here, which I unfortunately couldn't be part of. So given the upward trajectory of non-communicable diseases, particularly in Africa, where forecasts are that NCD-related deaths will over overtake the combined mortality from communicable, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases by 2030. This discussion could not be more timely. The promotion of diets that improve health but are also environmentally sustainable is emerging as a key global priority. This reflects a growing awareness of the extent to which global food systems are driving ecosystem imbalances climate change, malnutrition, and of course, chronic diseases. Yet, and I think you've discovered it in your discussions, implementation is not very simple. On the one hand, is the acceptance that a holistic approach is imperative to successfully conserving human, animal, and planetary health, protected from unsafe food products through vigilance and the application of, oh, sorry, on the other hand, are the often competing interests of the stakeholders and sectors charged with identifying and instituting the requisite solutions. However, there are collaborative mechanisms with potential to drive successful action. An example is a One Health approach, which aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, ecosystems, and the wider environment. Together with WHO, the One Health Quadripartite brings together the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, and the UN Environment Program. I'm certain this has already been mentioned to you during the course of this meeting. It mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities to work together to tackle threats to health and ecosystems while fostering well-being. It also addresses pivotal issues such as the collective need for clean water, energy and air, safe and nutritious food, along with climate change and sustainable development. We need all of that. We've heard a lot here today, I think, about the concept of food for health and how to put it into action for the good of people and communities. And I'm pleased to share that since the UN Food Systems Summit in September last year, 33 countries in the WHO African region, which is mainly sub-Saharan Africa and Algeria, have developed food systems transformation pathways. These are focused on, among other things, changes to public and private investments and policies to regulate food environments. Inter-country dialogues are continuing under the auspices of the African Union on the continent in partnership with UN agencies and non-governmental organizations working in the area of food and nutrition security. And within these dialogues, WHO is working with the AU Commission and the FAO to integrate food safety in the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. This will ensure 
that human health is protected from unsafe food products through vigilance and the application of the Codex Alimentaria standards in cross-border trade on the continent. Another outcome of the UN Food Systems Summit is the formation of global coalitions to work together to transform food systems in a globalized economy. These coalitions enable collective negotiating power while facilitating knowledge sharing. The coalition that is directly relevant to today's gathering is the Coalition of Action on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems for Children and All. Its aim is to act as a mechanism for coordinated action on healthy diets from sustainable food systems, facilitating the sharing of experience, championing policy actions, and gathering support, information, and even inspiration. Policy and regulation is a key area for action, and WHO recommends six related actions. First, taxation of unhealthy foods and the subsidies for healthier options, and subsidies for healthier options. I saw that in one of the slides a moment ago. Regulated marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages, especially to children. Labeling of packaged, packaged foods, including information on the content of certain ingredients, public food procurement for healthy diets, food reformulation to eliminate industrial trans fats and reduce salt and added sugars, and food fortification with vitamins and minerals. It's relatively easy to develop policies. It is their implementation that's the challenge, and I'm certain that's what you've touched on in the last couple of days. Among the main reasons are weak governance systems in less developed countries, and of course, opposition from private companies that are profiting from the uncontrolled marketing of unhealthy products. And unfortunately, they sometimes have support from some governments. For example, we've seen in Kenya that the attempts to implement regula regulation of breast milk subsidies uh, were challenged by two high-income countries, which I will not name here, at the World Trade Organization, which was set to discourage the Kenyan government. These companies also approached parliamentarians in Kenya to influence their policy position in, related, in relation to what their government is doing. However, we're happy to report that both attempts failed, fortunately, and I think what we need to understand and learn among themselves is what happened, why. But these are the sort of actions we need to be anticipating and which need to be addressed, hopefully, by our collective action. As such, it's critical for global coalitions, therefore, to mount effective international advocacy for accountability for borders. Accountability without borders, sorry, that's a phrase that my colleagues uh, told me about today, which I found very compelling, meaning we need to share the approach to accountability between different stakeholders if we were to achieve these objectives. And part of that is to encourage, compel food manufacturers to uphold the same food standards at home as they do abroad when they market their products. Although industry self-regulation has not succeeded in reducing accessibility to unhealthy foods, we observe that there is the emergence of some positive engagement, and hopefully this will get us to the results that we need. Examples include the upholding of food safety standards, food fortification, and the ongoing dialogue between international advocacy groups like Resolve to Save Lives, which is an NGO and a group that's working very hard on trans fats and uh, the sugar content and salt content in foods in collaboration with WHO and industry actors towards eliminating industrial trans fats from processed foods. Improving regulatory capacity is also an urgent, important action area for less developed countries. Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania have been supported through a multi-partner global regulatory and fiscal capacity building program, RECAP, to strengthen their national capacities for the development and implementation of regulatory and fiscal measures. 
These countries are advancing in updating food labeling standards and negotiations are underway to expand to other countries of the East African community. So again, working collectively within sub-regional intergovernmental organizations can also provide mutual support. Standards to guarantee safety and nutritional quality of food from farm to fork need to be developed, disseminated, and enforced. And this demands urgent capacity building alongside advocacy for developing countries to mobilize domestic and international funding. And let's not forget the importance of communities buying in. Experience has shown that when an idea works to address a recognized need in a community, that is adequate incentive for people to make the necessary effort to sustain the change. There's the example of the Alternative Livelihoods Initiative where WHO in partnership with FAO and the World Food Programme support Kenyan tobacco farmers to switch to producing alternative crops. The Tobacco Free Farm Project enables farmers to collectively source farm-related and other services, helps them to identify markets for produce and negotiate prices for various value chains while training them in good agronomy practices. After being supported with nearly four tons of seeds and other requirements, more than a thousand farmers in Kenya are now growing red beans on hundreds of acres of farmland previously dedicated to tobacco. The beans are high in iron and so have greater nutritional value, making them a preferred choice for purchase and distribution by the World Food Programme. And the associated benefits have been immense in these communities. They include improved school attendance among the children of these families who previously worked on the tobacco farms, improved household food security, reduced exposure in work-related chemicals, and tobacco smoke, and of course environmental conservation, and ultimately reduced poverty. Now the initiative is to expand the three to three other Kenyan counties and to two other countries, Uganda and Zambia. And as the previous director of non-communicable diseases in WHO some years ago, I can attest how much effort and how many years of relentless work this took. But it is an example that shows that working together, it is possible to reach such changes and such results. I'm sure that this is an example which is not quite uh, exactly what we're talking about in this meeting, but it shows, I think it can be applied across the issues that uh, concern us here, which are animal health, uh, food, healthy food, livelihoods for people, and then international regulations and national action by both uh, governments in uh, upper income countries where these industries have their homes and governments in countries that may be persuaded to consume these foods. We believe there's a lot of hope for these types of approaches. As WHO in Africa, we remain fully committed to the health and welfare of people across the continent and to forging partnerships with individuals and with organizations eager to support the work to achieving the goal of a healthier Africa and world. And I'm certain that we'll draw from your discussions today the inspiration and good ideas as WHO to play our role within the broader partnership to achieve that as well as a healthy planet. Thank you very much for the attention you've accorded me this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mwetu. Yeah.